All right, so today we're doing something a little bit different. It's not that abnormal for us. So we have a customer picking up this 194 by transport. Okay, so what I mean by that is they've saw, seen our price online. We were that much cheaper than their local dealer that they felt that it was cost benefit for them to ship it to California. So when you're wondering how good our pricing is, that's kind of how good it is. So I'm going to be giving them a quick little demo on this thing so they know how to use it. Fortunately, they've already owned a uh, RV in the past, so they know some of this stuff, but we're still gonna go over it from start to finish. So the first thing on the back here is going to be our cable TV hookup. This is where we would plug in at a campground for both cable TV or satellite. So if you're running a portable satellite dish, this is where you connect. Now, real quick on that, how do I connect my satellite? Contact your provider. Hang on, wait, we'll wait for Barb. All right, she's done. All right, so contact your satellite provider. So whoever you're gonna be going with, or if you're looking at multiple options, talk to them about the options for tailgaters, portable satellite dishes, things like that. That way we make sure you, you make sure that you get one that's going to work. Um, but this is where everything is going to run. And it is a little bit different depending on the brand. Now, the next thing in line, we have the power plug. Now on this power plug, you have one side that looks a little different and one side that looks a little different here. And I'm going to zoom in on this and we'll talk so, about that. Again. again, we have that connection point that looks a little different, same here. Now, the way that I typically do this is I start at the bottom and I roll in, press it in, and then you can see it's got just a little bit of a rotation. Then you have a locking ring that screws on from the outside here. It's a little black ring. Um, if you notice, I turned it to the left first. That's to try to help get it seated correctly. Sometimes they do not line up right off the bat. So if you rotate it to the left initially, that does help. Another thing to talk about is a lot of customers want to wire up their house to be able to run this thing on full 30 amps. If you do, make sure you have your technician that is wiring up your house, look at this sticker right here. It'll tell them exactly what they needed to do. 110 to 125, 60 Hertz, 30, 30 amp circuit, okay? Now, if you're going to be wiring up your house to, or you're not going to be wiring up your house, and you want this to be able to plug into a regular outlet, you can do that, okay? A couple of things to be mindful of. You can get the 30 to 15 amp adapters. We like the one that have an extension on them. Um, that being said, make sure that we're not running an extension cord other than a full 30 amp RV extension cord. You can find the links down below for those. That being said, um, if you're using a regular household extension cord, the problem that you're gonna run into is you're going to be sending a lot of amps and dropping a lot of power over that, which can create heat in the cord, which can create a fire hazard. Um, but the other thing, even if you're going directly into the socket, we went from 30 down to 15 amps. So we've cut our power in half. So we're not gonna be running the AC. We're not gonna be running the microwave. We're gonna be doing our bare bones basics of just operating, just charging the, the battery on the front here and things like that. It is not going to be much more than that. All right, so I've decided to try to take the jacket off to try to make this a uh, little bit more visible. It is freezing. That being said though, um, that is like one of my favorite lines though. I apologize for saying it so much. So this is our stabilizing jack here. Now, as the nickname goes, stab jack, stabilizing jack, okay? It is just for that, for stabilizing. It uses a three quarter inch socket. You wanna use a cordless drill to put them down, feel free to, okay? What you're gonna do is you're gonna bring them so they're about that far from the ground so you can take them the rest of the way by hand because I wanna feel how tight they're getting. Okay, depending on the ground compound, obviously on this cement, we're not gonna be doing much rotation. We're just going to get it snug, okay? On dirt, you may have the situation where you get them to the ground and then you still have to go a few more cranks as that ground compresses a little bit. So just use common sense there. Leveling is done off these tires, okay? So what we're gonna do, if you watch my other videos, what I like are the leveling bubbles mounted on the side and on the front on a flat piece of molding here that we know is a straight body line, okay? We're going to line up those bubbles on there at home. Then when we get to the campsite, we're gonna back the trailer into the spot that we want. If it says on the front, we're off by two. That means either two leveling blocks. You're getting links all for this kind of stuff down in the description. We're gonna put those blocks directly beside the tires pull straight forwards, slide them over the fresh tire marks, back straight up and we're done. So, and again with those jacks, three quarter inch socket, and you're just going to lower these guys down. Once they make contact, you're going to 
take them till they're, they feel tight. You don't want it to over crank them because you're going to break them. Now, these jacks will go down pretty far. However, the more pass about right there, the less stable it's going to be because, as you can see, they'll make the contact, but we're going to run into the problem that they don't have much support left in them. So, if you want to put some blocks underneath them, feel free to, okay? It's really going to depend on personal preference. I really don't mind that much with a shaky candle. It doesn't really bother me. I walk in these things all day. Some people really do not like it. So, even with this thing dropped down real low in the front, we're still able to make contact. And you can see they've made contact with the ground, but we really haven't got tight yet. I'm still using just two fingers to rotate this. You can see here the trucking company beside us backing up. There, they're starting to get snug. And see, I've got a little resistance there. Take one. That feels good there. That's gonna depend on every camper a little bit different, but take it to where it feels tight. I call it the redneck torque wrench right there in the forearm. I know the difference between tight and broke um, after breaking enough stuff. All right, let me get this off the ground. You don't need to watch this part. All right, I am actually drinking the coffee. It's just not sitting in a camera angle for fun. All right, so outside shower. As you know, we're gonna get these keys to the driver going to get them to the customer. We have hot and cold water outside. Now, one of the things I do like doing with these outside showers, and maybe I'll make a video on this one day, is I'll pop this guy off. And what you're doing is you're pressing right here, but on the back side. Okay, so we'll do that again a little bit slower. So you're going to press and just flex that ever so much just to snap that off. These have two little screw holes in them. So you can take a PVC pipe, take a uh, tent stake, JB weld it into the bottom of that, and mount this so your, P your shower can be at natural height, and that's your shower board. So slide that back in. Shower has an on-off switch on it. Everything on here has been winterized, so when you get it, you'll definitely want to watch our dewinterizing video. Fortunately, I did just do one on the uh, Apex 194, believe it or not. So, yep, it's locked. Always give it a tap to check. But yeah, I did just do a video on the 194 on how to dewinterize it. That's where these low point drains are going to come in. They're for their fresh water system. We're only going to be using them when we're winterizing, dewinterizing. Out there in California, you may not dewinterize a whole lot. So if you're in warmer climates and you're like, hey, do I ever need to use those? They're the lowest points of our fresh water connection. Maybe every so often. I mean, you guys can camp 12 months out of the year. Maybe every six months or so, you uncap them, just flush some water out of them. That way you make sure there's no stale water at the bottom of the system. But other than that, you do have a city water connection right here. Um, water pressure regulator, mandatory. Mandatory, mandatory, mandatory. I don't care where you put it. Um, that being said, uh, some people will put it directly onto the camper. Some will put it onto the campground. However you want to do it, feel free to. Did you get a camera angle? Am I going to make you YouTube famous? You're nervous now. You, 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 I'm not editing you out. You know that. <laughs> so, water pressure regulator is somewhere between the campground and the camper. Again, if you want to hook it directly onto the camper, hook it directly onto the campground after the filter, before your external water filter, however you want to do it. This up here is going to be our black tank flush. That's going to be a little bit different. So what we're going to do, we never empty our sewage tank unless it's two thirds of a tank full. We want the additional velocity to help flow everything out. So we're going to wait till that tank gets two thirds of a tank full. That means after a two day camping trip and we're only a third full, somebody's standing on the pedal on the inside. Volunteer for that job. That's better than being out here. So at two thirds of a tank full, you'll make your sewage connection onto the side there. Grab a hold of your black tank valve pull that the whole way open. Now, if you realize to get a two thirds of tank full, we have to have the valve in the closed position. We do want you camping in the campground with your valves in the closed position, because if they're open, first off, we're gonna let all the liquids flow out and the solids will build up. Eric is wandering in the background. I think he wants to be on YouTube. So if we let the liquids flow out, flow out and the solids build up, we're gonna create a bigger issue there. 
and gray tank. Some people will go, well, my gray tank is just liquid, so it's no problem. Well, there is a little bit of truth to that. Soap has residue and it will build up and stick at the bottom of the tank. So that's an issue there. It's not gonna create a clog or anything necessarily. But what we wanna make sure that we do is not let any of the sewage gases up and not get an undesirable amount of residue in the bottom of the tank, because that's what's gonna smell. So again, keep them both close until it's time to dump. When it's time to dump, black tank valve open first, let everything run out. Any quality sewer, ho sewer hose is going to have a clear 90 degree angle at the bottom of it, okay? So we're gonna be able to see everything coming out. Then we're gonna turn on the, this, okay? The black tank flush. That's rinsing from the top of the holding tank down, okay? Tank valve should be all the way open. Tank should be completely drained. Don't run it for more than 10 minutes because what you can do is overflow the sewage tank till it goes up the sewer vent pipe over the roof and you will call me and go, hey, I have a water leak coming from my sewage tank. Uh, it's not. So, um, or coming from the roof of my camper, it's coming from your sewage tank. So, what we're gonna do, turn that on, let it run. You'll see brown first, milky white second, and then you'll see what looks like river rapids. When we get river rapids, we're done, everything's good to go. Now, if it does take longer than 10 minutes, that's fine. Just make sure you shut it off. You commonly hear somebody use the term back flush in my sewage tank. That's an old term left over from when we used to have a jam, jam a garden hose in here or in the toilet on the inside and fill the toilet, the black tank from the ground up because we didn't have a device to rinse from the top down. We don't have to do that anymore. There's no reason to do it. You're only asking for problems if we do that. Next, we're gonna jump into the refrigerator. There's not much to talk about on there, but we're gonna zoom in a little bit, show you the do's and don'ts of the refrigerator. All right, so this is the backside of the refrigerator. This is a standard RV refrigerator, runs on LP gas and 110 volts. Now, the way that it does that, we have a unit here right here that a lot of people refer to as the cooling unit. It's an ammonia-filled unit that creates chemical reaction whenever we heat it up. Um, so we can heat it with either a 110 volt element to warm that system up, or we can heat it with LP gas. Um, obviously the flame gets hotter and the hotter that we get it, the quicker that reaction happens. That's why whenever we're utilizing the refrigerator, it cools down about two hours faster on LP gas. It still will take about eight to 10 hours normally to cool down. Um, so just keep that in mind. The unfortunate thing, as technology has grown, both in our modern vehicles and on our refrigerators, unless you're a service technician, there's not much reason to be in here. Mind you that all this stuff is gonna be hot. It's gonna be hot over here. If we're running the LP gas, it's gonna be hot over here because this is our chimney. So the only thing we're checking is this 12 volt, or this 110 volt plug right here. So if that guy's not plugged in, that's the only thing we're gonna be touching back here. Other than that, I need you to take it to a service dealership and have it checked out. Now, of course, we've already done that before our customer is going to be taking delivery of it, but just keep in mind, that's how we access it. There's two flat-headed slots right here. You're just gonna rotate those a quarter turn. Now, one of the things I often do whenever I get ready to travel is I grab this fridge, grab right in there, and give it a slight tug to make sure it is. You do wanna check your lug nuts prior to every trip. Um, is, is what the manufacturer recommends. So make sure you torque the lug nuts. Again, the link's down below for all this stuff. And we do have nitrogen filled tires. Every time your truck hooks to this trailer, you should be checking these tires. We'll go up front here and we'll show you what we're talking about as far as tire pressure goes. All right, so on the front here, we have these tire pressure stickers. Now there is two of them, okay? So we're going to read the English side, okay? Because I don't speak Spanish that well. So we got 65 PSI marked on this trailer. Every trailer is going to be different. So make sure you check your tire pressure sticker, not what's on the tire. You're also, if you're ever replacing, going to replace on what's marked there. It will give you the, not only the tire size, okay? but also the load range they want on there. You don't want to mess with that too much. The reason being is the tire doesn't sit on the road like this. It actually sits with a little bit of a cup. When you change load range, you may affect how much that tire cups. The more of that tire hitting the ground, the more um, friction we're going to have, okay? Number two cause of blown tires is overheating tires. Now, the reason we're so adamant about tire pressure, the number one cause of blown tires is tire pressure. The number two cause, again, going back to um, overheating, 
the number one cause of overheating is wrong tire pressure. So that all goes back to check your tire pressure, check your tire pressure, but always replace your tires with what the manufacturers told you to do. Understand that an engineer, okay, a dude with a degree is the one that said, this is the best tire for it, okay? So the guy at the tire shop doesn't have a degree, okay? Yes, he specializes in that every day and I respect that. However, the guy that sits with the engineering, with the, the, the AutoCADs, and comes up with the correct tire size and pressure is going to be the guy that I trust. So always replace tires with what's on there. Don't go to light truck tires and all this other goofy stuff that they do. Trailer tires are specifically designed for trailers. All right, so this is our slide room here. There are three basic rules to a slide. All the way in or all the way out. I do not want to stop this slide halfway in between. Now, one of the things you can do is when this slide comes the whole way out, you can cut one of those foam pool noodles so it's the same length as the slide protrudes from the side of the RV. That'll give you a quick little reference stick to see if you've got enough room. Another thing you can do is if you take your arm at a 90 degree angle and stick your other arm straight out, that's a quick little reference that'll usually give you enough room to walk in between it, okay? If you're getting tighter than that, definitely use that yardstick method because we do want this slide to travel the whole way in and out smoothly, okay? Rule number two is maintenance. We have a whole video dedicated to maintenance on the slide rooms, so please check the links down below and we'll have that. Rule number three is make sure nothing's underneath of it whenever it's coming in or on top of it, meaning the debris has been cleaned off the roof and we don't have any rocks or debris on the ground. Also, along with that, we don't need anything to support this underneath. You will see these guys selling these jack stand looking things that go underneath the slide room. They void the warranty. They don't tell you that. So the problem with them is as the camper settles at the campground, we do not have the ability to, for the slide to travel with it. It will keep the slide kicked at an angle. Okay, so it will kick it out of square, causing damage to the slide. We also have our fresh tank fill over here and a loud torture that's keeping it, bopping. Okay, it's not R2D2. I think it's almost gone. I'll just have another sip of my coffee here. All right, so our fresh tank fill is done right here. Okay, there is a device that does make that easier because a garden hose doesn't fit there. I'm um, gonna say it again, link down below. All right, so fresh tank drain is right there. That's where we're going to empty the fresh tank at and allow all our water to drain out. So that's what's gonna happen there. If we overflow it, you're gonna see the water coming out the little vent right there. All right, so now we're up to the front storage bay. On this 194, it does have pass-through storage and magnetic baggage latches. It's so nice that I forget to talk about. So you can see we've got the power cord packed up. We're back inside. We do have the jack handle on the side of there. This side is really just basically for storage. The other side's gonna have a couple of things on the inside of it, and we're gonna talk about more there. We do have our turn signal or our clearance light mounted on the front here. If you're going to install side mounted cameras, this is where you're going to do it at. So that system on the 194, I'll have a link here if you're gonna do a three camera system on what's going to operate what. 751 key locks our front, and we have our front stabilizing jacks here. Other than that, there's not a lot to talk about on this side. Let's move to the front. All right, so this is our propane tank cover here. We're obviously at the front of the unit. So we do have a quick access top that's got two wing nuts that you loosen on the top, thumb, two thumb nuts. And then on the bottom here, it's got a spot where you can attach a bungee cable to help hold it down. Now, as you can tell by the way I was pulling it off, it is stiff already, so a lot of people don't run it. Now, let's talk about some things that you should do. Prior to every trip, I do want you to take this wing nut and tighten it down. The front of these units is like a big tuning fork, okay? So it likes to vibrate going down the road. We're gonna get the vehicle vibration plus the trailer vibration all right here. So you wanna make sure you tighten that down prior to travel. Also, prior to travel, make sure you shut your propane gas off. Follow all local laws, regulations, and federal codes when transporting down the highway. Be sure to shut your propane tanks off. Underneath here, we do have the battery, okay? Now, this is an interstate marine grade battery at a unit that comes from Keystone RV as of right now, February 2021. Uh, we're using interstate marine grade batteries because no matter where you're at in the country, it seems like there's an interstate dealer nearby. There is a little bit of maintenance to this battery. It's not much. 
When you pop the cover off here, you'll see two caps on the top that you're going to remove, follow the safety instructions listed on the battery, and you're going to top them off with distilled water. Please only use distilled water. Anything other than that is going to destroy the battery. When you're doing that, every three to six weeks, that's usually our camping trips, I do like to tighten down the battery terminals. Now, as far as battery disconnects go, I like to manually disconnect the negative terminal when we come back from the trip, okay? And then, when I'm getting ready to go on the trip, I've already got my 916s wrench out, I can go ahead and tension down the batteries. Again, big tune is work. I don't want the battery terminals losing either not charging or going down the road, or even worse when I get to the campsite below the fuses. Let me show you a little bit closer what we're going to be doing with this propane uh, switch. All right, so we already talked about the legal for travel, you need these tanks off. So what I like to do, you have this little black throw lever here that does rotate. Some people will tell you to run it in the middle. I don't like that idea. The reason being is I want to point it towards whichever tank I'm going to draw from. I'm going to open up that tank, okay, and that tank only. That way, if I run out of LP gas, I have a reserve parachute. I know that I'm physically out because I had to come out here and open up this second tank, okay, and switch the lever over to that one. Okay, so that way when I'm camping, I don't have to worry about being completely out of both tanks. Again, I had to do a mechanical feature. So hopefully I'm smart enough to remember that. Up at the front here, we're going to have our trailer latch that we're going to use to latch onto the ball of the trailer. We have our tongue jack here that we're going to use to crank it up and down. And safety chains. For hooking up to our tow vehicle. We do recommend that you cross them and if you tuck them underneath here right behind where this tongue jack's at, they, they store away nicely. Now, I've got a product that I found that gives me a nice place to put these seven-way plugs that mounts right around these tongue jacks. So I'll make sure I put that link down there. All this stuff can be seen on the uh, website that I've got linked in here as well. Um, you do have the breakaway cable. I prefer the bungee breakaway cables. I'm getting ready to edit the video on how to install that. That should be up before this video even is. Um, and again, links for everything that I use in that video will be on that uh, in the notes on that one. So that's the front of the trailer there. Other than that, we got some LED lights right here that we're gonna go. Really, Eric? Right in the middle of my video. He's got no respect. All right, so. We do have a light switch on the front here to control the LED lights on the front of this trailer, okay? And we do have some more things mounted on the inside of here. We're gonna try to get the best shot possible when we're talking about this. So let's try to move over here real quick. All right, so inside of here, we do have our USB hookups and our 12 volt cigarette lighter right here. We also have that switch for those front LED lights that we discussed and our control panel here for the charging of our solar panel. Okay, so that's where all that action is gonna happen at. Everything's automatic. There's nothing really to mess with there. Magnetic baggage latches again on this side and we lock to secure. We do have a stabilizing jack on the front. And again, we do have that other clearance light. All right, there. so we're gonna do this in two shots because for once I don't wanna be hunched over, bent over and everything else during the video. So. Our entrance door handle, we just lift it up to rotate it. It can go that way, it can go straight. I like to transit going down the road like that because if the deadbolt fails, the handle lock fails, it gives me a third, third strike of uh, security. So when I open the door on most trailers, you're gonna have a key code mark there. Now I'm not gonna zoom in on the key code for everybody. So the key code is your vehicle specific key code. So if you forget your keys at the house, if you have that code, say you email it to yourself on a Gmail account that you can access on any email, including your phone, hopefully, you can take that key code to a reputable RV dealership and they'll be able to cut you a brand new key based off of that key code that'll get you into your trailer. Now we do recommend that when you lock your trailer, you do lock this deadbolt down at the bottom, okay? Otherwise it's not secure. The top one is referred to as a master lock because as you can see with my master key, I can lock and unlock it, okay? The deadbolt is key specific, okay? So I'm not gonna be able to do anything with that with a master key. Now when you lock these, you're gonna to rotate towards the door frame to lock, back to the middle to retrieve your key. Don't move that lift yet. I know you can be in the video too if you want. Now, nobody wants to do it. So towards the door frame to lock, back to the middle, retrieve our key, 
away from the door frame to unlock and again back to the middle of the retrieve our key with the master lock or with the deadbolt with the master lock all we're going to do is rotate it to the right to lock it and pull our key out and rotate it to the left to unlock it and pull our key out now we're going to talk about the entrance steps real quick we're going to get a better zoom you'll be able to move in a second give me a second so you've got the and then Barb jumps in to make it take even longer for you. I know, you can't hey, believe okay. it. You know. All right, so you've got a big yellow handle here to release the steps and drop them down. You do have individual pins to adjust the steps. Let's go over on how you do that correctly. Now you can move. All right, so these steps, we're just gonna grab that handle, flip them out. Now I do like the step legs retracted whenever we bring them in. And then, when we drop them down, we're going to let this black metal touch on this silver metal. And then we're going to pop one pin out, let that leg drop to the ground. Line it up right there. And then do the same on the other side. Three, four, three, four, one, please. Will it three, four, one. Now the reason that we want to do the steps in that way so that touches is so that when we close the door we don't have any obstruction issues with this hitting the door frame itself. Now the reason I like to flip those step legs up whenever we bring the stairs in is so that we minimize how much contact we could make with this door. Okay, So if I bring those legs down it helps reduce the angle of those steps that could be poking into the door. So a few things to talk about down here. One of the things that I want to mention is we do have an LP gas quick connect. So that does make it nice if you want to run an outside barbecue grill. It has a ball valve shutoff on it, okay? So if the pipes run in like this and the valves like this, it's in the closed position, okay? That valve floats whichever way that handle's pointed. So if you bring it like that, it allows it to open. It does have to be in the closed position for you to connect your LP gas line to it. And I do have uh, a couple of things on my site that do show you the different uh, types of grills that are out there. Um, 110 outlets right there. Furnace ventilates on this side. We do have our sticker detailing our Lions Head warranty on these tires. You have a one year, no excuses guarantee, as printed right there, and two years of roadside assist. Okay, so definitely read about that information make sure you do the registration that you need to for that there's even a qr scan code right there you notice we got a second sticker talking about these lug nuts and tires okay so definitely make sure we're doing the lug nuts and tire pressure I, yes i am going to mention it again and do my little duck walk here we do have our hot water heater on this side well technically it's a cold water heater if it's a hot water heater the water is already hot what do we need it for nothing really to talk about on that everything for this guy is done inside the only thing to mention is when i get to the campsite one of the things i'm going to do is i'm going to pull this valve to make sure that i got water coming out of it that the tank is filled right now it's in the bypass mode because it's winterized again we have the video on how to de-winterize this trailer as well as winterize it um, and i'll try to link those down below outside compartment does flip open so we do have access to our refrigerator Make sure you watch our video that we talk about how to uh, modify these fridges. So if you do want to travel with a little bit of stuff in there, some Velcro straps at the top, a little bit of sanding um, so they get a good adhesion. Those 3M Velcro straps work great. Plus, we got the Coleman Camp Grill on this one. Now this does utilize those little green LP bottles. So we already got a camp stove here, but we do have the option for more. Um, you also have a 110 outlet back inside of there, so if you do want to run anything out here, you can. And the ever important bottle opener. Snap it shut for transit, and just close the door. Sorry about that banging and clanging in the previous shot. That was the uh, overhead lift moving around, changing out, going to some LED lights, trying to be slightly more energy efficient. So on the back here, we do have a spare tire. Make sure you're checking this tire pressure as well. Every time you get ready to tow, every time the ball drops onto the hitch, or vice versa, whichever way, running out of coffee, and I got no monsters. So make sure you're checking that tire pressure. Last thing you want is needing it and it empty, okay, or no good. 
we do have the clearance lights on the back here. So if you're going to be installing backup camera, um, the lights will have to be on the, the camera that'll work best for this. I'll link there um, for a three camera system. We'll be replacing that center lens. Um, so you're just gonna be connecting the power and the ground wire to it um, uh, once you replace the housing. Um, it's not that difficult, but it does require a little bit of modification and some resealing. So let's talk about resealing on an RV. Anywhere they cut a hole in it, that'll work. Anywhere they cut a hole in it, you know, for the lights and stuff like that, there's going to be sealant. Up there, there's going to be sealant. And if you notice, they only seal the top because if water does get in, they want it to have a weak spot for it to come out. Okay? Anywhere they join pieces together, like when they join the sidewalls, there's going to be sealant down through here. Every 90 days, we want you to visually inspect your trailer. Most customers wash, wash their camper every three months. So visually inspect, see if you see any obvious sealants. If you feel comfortable enough to reseal it yourself using a caulking gun and RV um, seal it, go ahead and do that. Okay, you're gonna be checking the side walls, the rear walls, the front cap, and the roof, people. Okay, you gotta double check on the roof too because that's where we get a lot of flex. A lot of times we see them in the corner. The average camper is going to have about an hour and a half to two hours of resealing per year, okay, per 12 months. That being said, I don't know where to tell you to find that hour and a half to two hours. That's why we're gonna be doing that visual inspection. So typically it is in the corners, but you do wanna look around and see if you see anything. So while you're watching it, just pay attention to it. Let's go inside. So before we go inside, we're gonna be talking about this awning. Now we have a switch right on the inside panel here, which whenever we talk about the rest of the stuff there, we can go over. We have one that's gonna be an on-off switch that's white that's going to be turning on our LED awning lights. The other one, and you wanna make sure your door is at a 90 degree angle, allows you to extend your awning. The switch is labeled both in and out. Make sure you're paying attention to that when you're putting it out. You want to look at that and then as the awning goes out you want to visually inspect and make sure that it's not going to hit anything whether it be the door your neighbor's camper tree whatever flying pigs possibility okay it is 2021 okay we live through 2020 now when we roll this awning out we're going to see a flap of hair and here it's starting to come down now and that's going to indicate that the awning is the full way out you don't want to overextend this awning can actually continue to hold the out budget, it will actually start to wrap itself up backwards. When you bring it in, you want the fab fabric to be on top of the awning. Now we do have adjustment nuts on either side here that allow us to grab and pitch an angle this awning to help with water runoff. Slug that down. But what you don't want is this door dragging here. Now again, I did say you can pitch an angle either side. Okay to control that water runoff or try to get as much shade as possible, okay? But again, just make sure you're not tearing up the door. Apex is great. They do put a radius door on there so we don't have to worry as much with a square cut door to uh, rip and tear, but we still don't want to abuse it too much. Now, the reason we want that runoff is to control the water that could build up on this awning. You'll hear people talk about the awnings are built in with an auto dump feature. That's just not true at all in any way, okay? So, make sure you keep an angle to it. The other common question we get is, there's three. Do I need to bring my, straighten up my awning on this, before bringing it in? On this one, yes you do, okay? The other two most common questions, how much wind is too much wind? How much rain is too much rain? When you're asking that question, it's time to bring it in. Alrighty, so let's start by giving us some room on the inside of this RV. This is our slide control right here. We have an in and out setting you're going to press and continue to hold the position that you want, whether it's in or out, and you're gonna hold for a five count afterwards, even after the slide stops moving for a five count because this slide can make little adjustments if needed to make sure it's seated completely flat um, once it's all the way in or out. Now obviously you do want to be looking at the slide, making sure we don't have any obstructions as it goes out. And now that it's the whole way out, two, three, four, five. I can let my finger off the switch. This is the controls for our awning lights and this is the controls for our 
uh, awning itself for both in and out. Let's take around and look around all this other stuff that's in here. All right, so we got a whole bunch of stuff right here, so we're going to talk about that. Smoke detector does smoke detector stuff, okay? There is a 9-volt battery that goes in here that is stored in the unit. It will be in the unit before it leaves the shop. It is a brand new battery. I do recommend replacing it out in California. You will be in your camper during daylight savings times, and um, that's not really an issue. In the Northeast here, daylight savings times were often not in the camper. So I recommend replacing it at the beginning of every camping season, um, and again, right there uh, six months afterwards. So if you start in April, um, usually October, we're done our camping season. If you do run longer than that, go ahead and replace it. Don't try to cheat it. Uh, life support uh, item right there is cheap. Um, fire extinguisher is located right here, right beside the door. My opinion with fire extinguishers, everybody should operate a fire extinguisher before they need to operate a fire extinguisher. And I'll show the LP gas uh, detector whenever we're over there by the refrigerator. LP gas detector is set off by three things. Low battery voltage, carbon monoxide, or LP gas by design. Okay, here's some other stuff that may set it off. Um, cheap, dry dog cheap dry dog food uses corn as a filler. The corn releases ammonia and sets off the LP detector. Also, I've had customers actually stop by a roadside stand, get a couple of ears of corn, throw them in the camper, and that's also set it off. Um, anything in an aerosol can that uses propane to get it out. Um, that's going to set off the LP detector as well. Um, so you want to pay attention to that. Um, so hairspray, bug spray, spray cooking spray, spray tanning lotion, any of that stuff that uses propane to get it out. Um, the other thing that'll do it is the proper amount of natural gas, a fart. Uh, there's no nice way of saying that. So just keep that kind of stuff in mind. Um, if it does start going off, treat it like an actual emergency, get out of the camper, wave your arms around the detector, make sure it gets a fresh air in there and that should take care of the problem. Um, that being said, we do have LED lights here, they are all push button lights, just press right in the center, that turns them on. And we are pre-wired for the um, Wi-Fi extender, or um, this will actually, you can now go to a 4G setup on this as well. Um, understand the limitations of this, we've done a video on this as well. Wi-Fi extenders only extend the Wi-Fi for the campground that's there. It does not improve the video, or, yeah, the video, it does not improve the Wi-Fi strength, okay? like. If they had dial-up, you get them dial-up. The problem I have at the campground that I'm at, um, they got a Comcast modem box, okay, that's designed for like 15, 20 devices. That's it, okay? And they got 400 sites there. Guess what you ain't gonna get? You ain't gonna get movie streaming quality. So just keep that in mind. I'm getting ready to do a video series on how I do Wi-Fi in my camper and how I do movies and stuff like that. So I'll go over that. Um, got another light over here. And we'll talk about the TV connections here in a second. I'm gonna set the camera up a little bit different angle, get us a better view there. Um, and we'll do the stereo next as well. All right, so as you can see, we do have our TV backer in the wall here. Um, it is prepped for a television. If you wanna run one, you can. You are going to mount a TV bracket. Make sure you're mounting an RV TV bracket, especially swiveling brackets, okay? And the way I explain it is, hey, I'll bet you $100 you can't keep a five pound weight dead center of your chest for 30 seconds. Everybody like, that's a good idea. I'll take that. I'll get you to put you on the hay wagon, do fourth gear through the cornfield. That's what we're gonna ask our TV brackets to do. So make sure you're purchasing one designed for RV travel. And if you are gonna have a swivel aspect to it, make sure that we would have a way to secure it back. Otherwise it's gonna be flopping around going down the road. Okay, TV antenna boost is located right here and our cable connection is made right there. We also have a 110 volt power plug right there to run everything for that. Okay, so when we are running the TV antenna boost, it will amplify the signal when we are drawing it from the TV antenna. What you want to be sure that you're not doing is running it whenever we are um, trying to draw from the campground cable. It's going to scramble every channel coming in. I already do have a video on how to set up the campground cable or set up the TVs for the digital TV signals. Um, it's just going through and programming your TV to do a search for the local network. Um, you do have blinds throughout this entire unit. There are little sewing bobbin looking guys down here at the bottom on either side. If you have a blind that is sagging or leaning, what you can do is grab this string and put a twist on it to help remove that 
or even twist in the bobbin will make these strings tighter, therefore making it uh, that side of the blind stay up. So just keep in mind, strings do stretch. They are going to stretch over time. There's no solving that. So these little plastic bobbins is how we solve that problem. Um, new RV, since we're shipping it, mattress cover is still right inside of there. Um, mattress is a 60 by 80 mattress. So it is a standard queen mattress. So there's no need to purchase additional um, mattress, uh, specialty mattress sheets or anything like that for that. And got our overhead cabinet storage this right our there. stereo right here. Power button in the middle wakes it up. And then we can use the up and down arrows to change stations, pressing and holding. We'll scan through the stations quickly. You have zone A, which it'll say zone A speaker off. And it does show me that I have B illuminated up here at the top towards the center. B is going to be those outdoor speakers. A is going to be the inside. And we are able to do the different channels for each one. We do have an HDMI slot, so we do have a HDMI selection there. We do have USB hookups. We do have time settings, AM, FM. Everything is all right there. Press and hold to power the unit off. You do have programmable stations down here, so everything can be set. Um, I'm going to. So we got another LED light over here. We do have our sink covers here. I do prefer that if we are traveling down the road, okay, that I store these somewhere else. So if there's water in the tanks, that this has somewhere to go, even if there's only a little bit of water pressure in the line still a lot of times i do like to remove those for transit we ship them just the way the manufacturer does you do have your stove cover here it has a little cut out on the edge we just simply lift that up little sparker built in so we'll turn the stove to light fire it off and we've got a nice little flame right there we do have the microwave mounted down below plus standard microwave stuff but you do have to be plugged into 110 volt power to operate inside of this unit in this upper cabinet towards the door, there is a yellow sheet in there. Treasure that thing. It is every model number and serial number to every appliance put inside this unit. It is something handy to have. And then we have the owner's manuals. Now Coachman puts every owner's manual to everything they put inside this trailer. What they don't do anymore, which I actually like here the whole way out, is they don't use a generalized owner's manual from Forest River for every Forest River trailer ever made. Okay, so what they're doing now is you have an app that you download that you'll go in, you'll select your year, make, model, and then you'll download basically a PDF that stores to your phone. That's your owner's manual. It has individual tabs. It's a lot more product specific than what they used to be. So much better of a design. I don't know what took them so long to do that. This stove top, you're going to lift up slightly because it's got a lockout so it doesn't fly forwards. So we're going to lift up slightly and close once it's cool enough to touch those burners. Okay, it is a glass cover to give us additional countertop space not to cook on. We do have a string tie right here that brings the cord up and out of the way. Obviously, you can trim this cord back if you want, but blind operator up and down. Pretty straightforward and simple there. And then we do have additional storage down below here. Nothing big and fancy to talk about there. Let's continue to move around this unit. So again, a whole lot of stuff happened in this little area. Down here, we have our converter, okay? This is going to be taking 110 volt power coming into the camper, breaking it down to 12 volt, charging the battery through that, and then the battery comes back and runs the 12 volt fuses. Make sure you have some spare fuses, understand how to replace them, understand how to reset a breaker. Those are the common things. They are residential breakers, so if you can flip a breaker at the house, you can do that. We do have the furnace ventilating right there. We do have cabinet storage here and here. We do have our furnace switch right here. Now this top lever, you pull this way. You'll see that it says on and off. And I don't know if you can hear that, but it is not a soft pull. Everybody thinks they're gonna break it, okay? You got temperature adjustment down here. Now, even after you shut it off, the fan is gonna continue to run on the furnace to make sure that it cools itself down. You do have your carbon monoxide LP gas detector down here, which we've already discussed. There is a test button right here 
that you can press in. Um, it's kind of a ribbed up a little bit, you'll feel it. And that's how you test your LP detector, make sure you're testing that twice a year. You do have the refrigerator right over here. And you have these fridge tabs right here. So when you get back from a camping trip and the unit's gonna be parked, you just expand this tab out, drop that point inside the refrigerator door, and then take the door and close it up. That way the fridge stays ajar once we're home and parked. That way the refrigerator is allowed to ventilate out so we don't develop any moldy, musty situations. There are two of them. They are $20 a piece, don't lose them. We also have some lights and some 110 outlets for the pumps, both top and bottom. This is going to be our water panel door for both our water pump and for winterizing our um, uh, hot water heater or cold water heater, however you want to talk about it. So let me get a little bit closer to this fridge and let's talk about that. So here at the refrigerator, we have two switches to worry about. We have an on switch and an auto gas switch. In is on, out is off. In is auto and you'll get a yellow light that displays and out is gas and you'll get nothing that displays. If there's an issue, you'll get a check light on the right hand side that'll display. Now, the fridge on auto is gonna look for 110 volt power first. If you cannot find it, it will automatically switch over to LP gas. We did talk about the fridge a good bit when we were outside, going over, making sure that you know that it takes eight to 10 hours to cool this guy down, things like that. So, for the most part, the only thing we have to talk about I'm going to have to get the phone off here. Is, because I couldn't find a way to do the camera angle before, is this little guy right here that we can adjust the temperature of the refrigerator by sliding up. Now, what people commonly do is they'll slide it up quickly and they'll drop this little probe out. Okay? That probe has to ride. Try doing this on camera. Inside of there. The higher up it goes, the cooler it goes. You can see that probe is secured in there now. So just make sure you don't drop that guy out and you can see that it's got some slack down there. We can force it up a little bit more if you want, but that's the gist of the fridge. And there's those little plastic tabs we were talking about earlier. Let's see if, while well, we got it in our hand. All right. Let's move to the bathroom real quick. All right, and now we're on a forward mounted camera to save me a little bit of yoga poses. So you can see there's a line through this whole toilet, okay? What that indicates is a fill line. Prior to your first camping trip, I want you to fill this up four times and add toilet chemicals to it, okay? There's a lot of brands out there, pick one and stick with it, okay? That being said, the reason we want to do that is we want to have a base layer of water in there. Every time you empty the holding tank, I want you to repeat that process, four fills and toilet chemicals, even if it's going to sit in the backyard. The reason being is if there's a piece of toilet paper stuck to the side of the tank, I want to keep it wet on the inside of that tank. And that moisture is going to condensate up to the top, drop down to the bottom, keeping that toilet paper wet and malleable, rather than turn it into rock hard cement, paper mache style stuff. Now. You have a foot valve down here that's just slightly off camera. If you push it part of the way down, it's going to fill the tank. If you press it all the way down, it's going to empty. That being said, if you go number one in here, I want you to flush down what happened and fill it to the line once. If you go number two, flush down what happened, fill it to the line twice, okay? Over here on the wall, let's angle this just a little bit. A little bit of jitters. There we go. Now we have our hot water heater set up. There's one that has a lightning bolt and one that has a little flame, and they do respectfully that, electric and gas. Now, when we turn the gas side on, we will get a little red light if there is a fault. If the light stays on for longer than 90 seconds after flipping the switch on, turn your stove on, burn off any additional, any air that might be in the gas lines from changing a tank over or just having them off, then try relighting it. The electric element, be sure to t open up that valve on the outside so we don't cause any damage to the electric element on that. Remember, we had that little brass valve that we we're going to pop open to bleed any air out of that might be in there till we see water. 
we have a little red switch here that is the water pump. Okay, we're only going to use that when we are running the water pump to draw water from the holding tank to pressurize the faucets. If we're at a campground hooked up to city water, we don't need it. We also have a battery, fresh, black, and gray tank monitoring system all right there. We have a GFI outlet here. Most of the outlets in this trailer have a little white sticker on it that says GFI protected, but they don't have this outlet. Okay, the reason, i go ahead and put that flat. The reason for that is they're wired back into this guy. You also have a medicine cabinet up top here. You have a little additional tie for this guy. We like to tie them in a small little knot, it tends to work pretty good. You have additional storage down here. And as you can tell, this is a little bit tighter of a bathroom as I'm trying to shoot this. Let's see if we can film. So for the shower, when you have water pressure on, you'll pull this to divert the water up to the shower head. The shower head itself has an on off valve. Middle is on, left or right is going to be off. And we have a little hanger up on the wall to hold it into place during transit. Just take it and set it just like that. You do have the tub surround on this one. If you have not watched me shave my legs on a YouTube video, you can tune into that channel that on our YouTube channel, Keystone RV Center. Our air conditioning is right here. We do have a temperature adjustment right here and fan speed controls here. We have a vent to open up and dump out here. We have a filter located inside of here. Thing I'd say about the filter is remember, washing a filter is free. Replacing them is about $15 to $30 and uh, replacing ACs is $1,500. We have diverter valves on all four sides. Then we have our fantastic fan back here that we can crank up. And we have a three speed adjustment. Now you can put covers on these things so you can operate them going down the road. Why would I want to do so? This AC is not a magical piece of advice. Physics do not stop existing inside of an RV. So with an AC, it removes heat from air, okay? Doesn't produce cold air, it removes the heat from the air. It's going to do that in an efficiency rate of approximately 10 degrees per hour. We get this call all the time. Got to the campsite at one o'clock, it was 120 inside my RV. It's only 93 hours later, what's wrong? Nothing, it's working, okay? So if we're able to run this as an attic fan going down the road, that is going to drastically improve how much that we do with that. If it drops at 10 degrees, that's an hour of that running. If it drops at 20, that's two hours. Great, fantastic. So definitely look at investing in those. Again, we do have another push, push light right there. And that's what you need to know about the roof ACs and the fantastic fans. Again, do not run the lids open if you don't have a vent cover lid over top of it, either by fantastic fan, Max Air, whoever. We have storage doors on either side here and here. The table legs break down. You'll just rock this table back and forth and then rotate the legs out when you're re and then drop them down so the table sits here. You also have storage access through the top. When you set the table back up, my advice is to put the legs in first and then set the table on top of that. Now, we do have a vinyl lining on the back side of our seat cushions that way, if you come back from the swimming pool, you have wet bathing suits, you're not wet for dinner. You also have vinyl lining on the bottom, so if you're really dirty after a hike, you can get that taken care of. I'm just gonna rotate the camera at this point and try to get a couple of more things to talk about. See, I told you you're going for a ride. Let's set that right there. We have our 110, we have, I'm sorry, 110's over here. USB and 12 volt outlets right here. So we can do cell phone charging, things like that. I do love all the 12 volt plugs they put in this guy. That way, if I end up running uh, to a camping trip and I forgot my chargers, I can pull the ones out of my car and use those. Thank you guys so much for purchasing this RV. Really does mean a lot to me that you trust me from this great of a distance to handle your RV purchasing needs. If you ever need anything, you of course have my cell phone number. If you're watching this video and you're thinking about purchasing this unit, please feel free to reach out to Keystone RV Center in Greencastle, Pennsylvania. My name is Junior. My, my phone number at the office is 1-800-232-3279. No, I'm not gonna get my cell phone out over the internet quite yet. So, that being said, this unit 
is just getting ready to get go into detail now that I've mucked up the inside and she'll be ready to ship out to California here shortly. God bless. Have a great day.